So um, I have a lot of material, unfortunately, but the good news is I didn't finish my slides. So we're going to get through uh, most of it, but I won't get to the end of it. Um, but I'll probably be about the right amount of material. And uh, in some ways, this is a continuation of what we were talking about earlier in the week. But in some ways, it's a new material too. Um, I've been very, um, I feel like I've been very productive mentally this last couple of weeks. So mostly that means I'm getting clarity on things, which are really confusing normally. So I'm going to try to share if I can, by talking to you, see if I can both help everyone understand the same things and get some feedback and um, et cetera. Um, th th this is, you know, we're talking about the, our, our roadmap and we want to get to the, you know, reference frames. And I mentioned yesterday in a, in the, uh, when I was in the office that really what we want to get to is not reference frames. We want to get to more object modeling, you know, structured modeling of objects. And so most of this talk will be about that. What does that mean um, to build a model? And it's going to be all phrased in terms of neuroscience, unfortunately. And, uh, but, but that's not because we want to implement the neuroscience. <laughs> it's just where we are. That's where I think. And so when I go through this, you, it's not like these are all things that are important that we have to implement from our machine learning point of view. And it doesn't mean we have to do it this way at all. It just means that just I'm trying to get um, clarity and thought about the tasks that, that we have to achieve. And I do that thinking about the brain. So if that's, are there any questions about that? Not that I've said anything that's important yet. No, I think that'll be good to clarify. I mean, Lawrence and I were just chatting yesterday. I was trying to explain what we mean by structured models. And yeah. uh, it'd be <laughs> okay. good to build up you know, language and, and ability. To all right, well, that's, I'm gonna try. And, and we struggle with this stuff. So, you know, it's all, it's all a work in progress. Um, I'm gonna start actually finishing up. I have one slide I wanna talk about voting. Um, you know, Subita, you did a couple of sessions about the mechanisms of voting. And I had some additional thoughts. Some of these I don't think I've mentioned before. I think they're new. And uh, but some of them that certainly not everyone's heard. So uh, this is not about the mechanisms about voting, but some more ideas about voting, some new ideas about voting. I'm going to talk this one slide on that. Uh, I think there's a, to me, some of these ideas are really actually pretty exciting but they're just ideas at this moment. And then I will switch completely and we'll talk about objects and modeling of objects. So new ideas about voting. This is how we typically show it. We show that there's like, oh, these voting neurons on layer two, three um, that go between columns. That's true, but there is another set of voting neurons. Uh, we don't talk about it too often, but it's very well documented. Well, they're not documented voting neurons. There are other sets of neurons in layer five that uh, do the same kind of long range projections as the cells in layer two, three. So these long range projections are well documented not that anyone else has any idea what they're doing. Um, and I interpret this as there's actually at least two populations of cells that are voting because in layer two, three, there's different cell populations. They may be voting on more than one thing. There may be two different uh, you know, cell populations that are voting on two different things. And layer five is at least, there are, there are two, maybe three cell types in layer five, depending how you count them. And so they're going to be at least doing something. And so I assume those are voting as well. They have the same kind of anatomical connections as you see in layer two, three are very similar. So when we say these voting neurons, remember we're saying like a particular type of cell, let's say in layer five, is connecting to the very same particular type of cell in columns in other layer fives. So they're all voting on the same thing. So there are at least two, maybe more sets of cells that have long range connections and seem to be voting. Now, Here's the big thing. There's a, I have, I'm constantly working on this hypothesis, but let me state it explicitly because I've never really, I don't always really state it explicitly. So anything you're conscious of, any recallable memory, like you just can say something, anything you can tell me, anything you describe verbally is communicated by voting neurons. That this is the means of information being passed around the brain. Um, it's not, it's not, there is still information that's passed between regions that's more of this hierarchical connections, like between layer two, three, and layer four. But the idea is that what you're conscious of is these, this sort of spread of this large spread of activity, of these stable, um, it's a very fast communication system. It's saying large parts of the brain are all going to be exposed to the same thing, and they can all know about it. And this is really interesting because 
uh, we've talked about voting in terms of object ID. So, we, you know, that's how we've described it. Uh, yes, you're voting on the object ID. But that's not what you perceive. Right? You don't just perceive, when I see a coffee cup or touch a coffee cup, I don't just perceive coffee cup. Um, I perceive that it's a coffee cup. I perceive its pose relative to my body. So I know where it is and its orientation to me. You know, the coffee cup is at a particular position at a particular orientation to me. And if the object has some sort of state like the stapler, I also perceive the state. I, I, I see, perceive the stapler is open or closed or this app is open or that app is open. Um, and so these, these are the stable representations. These are the things that, you know, as my eyes are moving and I'm looking at, you know, something, um, the pose, the object ID, it's, it's positional to my body, whatever state it is, those are all stable. And, um, and therefore I assume that those are voting, those are being voted on. It's not just the object ID. Otherwise I just have some sort of, of you know, ethereal idea there's a coffee cup out there. No, I know where it is. I know its position and orientation to me and I know in whatever state it's in. And so those have to be voted on. Those are not things that, um, that you would know otherwise. Um, so there might be other things that are voting on, but I use this sort of uh, conscious perception, um, stability of perception as sort of the, the metric, right? Because there's lots of things we don't perceive, things that are going on in the columns, we're not perceiving our eyes moving, we're not perceiving the changing inputs from the retina, but the stability of our perception is the same. Um, so, and this is whatever you attend to. So I attend to a chair to my left right now, I see this particular position and orientation to me, I, I look at the, my coffee cup on the, on the table next to me and so on. Um, what's become yeah, clear- so I have a question yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. What about uh, motor actions? Like I'm aware that I'm about to reach and touch my laptop screen or whatever. You know, I can I can consciously think about that and make that movement. Um, you know that that you know when we have to make a motor action, I could imagine there's a voting process involved in that as well. Yeah, but, uh, I think I you're probably right, and this yeah. is why I was careful to say at a minimum. Um, Although what, the motor action could be handled a couple of different ways. I could clearly imagine the opening the stapler and I could imagine in its open state. And if I imagined it in its open state, I might be sharing that. Um, so I think you're right, Subhita. I, I, I wanna be careful here. I say it's at a minimum, um, but these are the things I'm absolutely certain about. And, and maybe the motor stuff is, you brought, is a, good, a good addition. I don't know. Um, yeah, if, if every cortical column is outputting some sort of a motor command, there could be a very confusing set of motor commands if there's no voting. Yeah, I think that's that's right. I mean, yeah. well, if, if the motor command is to move to, yeah, I think that's a little confusing because it is. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's put that uh, file that away as like, huh? Let's think about that. <laughs> okay, can we do that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really. You know, we, we've never addressed at all. The idea of coordinated motor motor movements between columns. We haven't really done that. Um, you know, I could say, "Oh, I want to reach for the coffee cup," but how is it that all the different joints and so on would do that? We you know, and and so we just haven't done that at all. And I don't I don't want to go there today. But you're right. As I said, the other things should be voting on. It's not a you know it's it's a limited number of things. It can't be too many. I mean, I could argue that I I could maybe come up with five possible sets of neurons that are voting. Um, it might be just two, it might be three, it could be four, but you know, I, 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 given what I know of the anatomy, I could maybe imagine five, um, meaning separate cell populations that are reaching uh, consensus about different things. We do know that the actual motor cells uh, that generate actual moments are also in layer five, but they don't seem to do this kind of long range connection. So they don't seem to be doing this sort of voting. So, but the, this, the pyramidal cells next to those motor cells do have these long range connections in layer five. Um, I, just to stick to the things I mentioned there, um, it's really interesting that these signals, meaning like, let's just say object ID, state, pose, uh, are sufficient to do a bunch of things that have really uh, confused us for a long time. The first one is labeled train across modalities. We have used, as for those of you who are new here, you've heard us joke about that we call this disjoint pooling and then Marcus recently said, why don't we just get rid of the term? <laughs> but we used it a lot. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a type of knowledge transfer. 
And it could be very simply described as the following. I reach into a, 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 a box. I feel something with my index finger. I, and I learn three different objects using my index finger. I've never seen these objects, but I felt them with one finger. Now, I could reach into that same object and use a different finger and infer each object. So how is that? I've, I've trained my index finger column on the object model, but now I can use my pinky and my pinky's never been exposed. So how do the columns in the pinky learn this model? How do they know how to infer it? Or I could go with my left hand. Or another way to think about it is I could um, reach in and learn three objects using touch with one finger. And then later I show you those three objects visually and you can tell which is which. So there's this, this is a little sort of fundamental problem that we never addressed in our papers. Um, this is how does this knowledge get distributed? And you know, a classic example, a classic view of this from a neuroscientist would be like, well, there's a sort of Uber model high up in the cortex, high up in the hierarchy. And that Uber model is now feeding back down to all the other, you know, your fingers and so on. And they wouldn't think that the model of the, of the coffee cup is in your finger column. But this solves, this allows us to solve the problem because if I am transmitting the following things uh, across the cortex, um, if I have to make one assumption I didn't mention above, it's that the pose is relative to the body, not to the finger. So, and that's what you perceive. You, you, your number one perception, if I reach or see something, it's where the, the object is relative to my body. So assuming that's being voted on, then a lot of columns are being exposed to, hey, there is a, an object at some location posed relative to your body and in some state. And even if I'm a visual cortex, a visual column will be getting that from my, my finger. And the visual column says, well, I know what that object is. I know what an edge is. I know what a handle is. Um, and you're telling me that there's a handle here at this position and next to it, there's a rim and next to it, there's a cylinder and so on. I can visualize that as you're touching it with your finger. And so literally when you touch something with your finger in a black box, you can visualize what it looks like. How is that happening? It's the voting neurons. I'm, I'm virtually certain of this. The voting neurons are sending us around saying, Hey, I'm a, I'm a finger and I'm sensing these objects at these positions and these you know, orientations. Then everybody else who knows those sub objects can say, yeah, I can visualize that too. And therefore I can learn that same model as you're learning it. I don't have to see it. I can just, you can tell me about it and I'll build up this model. It's also skipping to the next bullet to point there, form episodic memories. If you think about everything, your moment to moment memories of the world, um, which are typically stored in the hippocampus. Um, they consist of things like this. They consist of what you've perceived at different positions, at different orientations, <laughs> in different states relative to your body. So, and it's really, it's the specific um, episodic memories are relative to your body. They're not generic memories, like a model of something. So I'll say, yeah, where was I sitting when I had my muffin this morning? Oh, I remember where I was sitting, what chair I was in. Where, where was the muffin on the counter next to me? Was it to my left or to my right? I remember all these things. It's part of my episodic memory of this morning. So that stream that comes across these voting neurons is sufficient. If I could remember that stream, I will remember the sequence of things I did today specifically. And, um, and I think that's how that's done. And then finally, it says something about language. And I don't know exactly what it says about language, but I'm pretty excited about it because um, uh, in some sense, if I want to describe what I'm seeing or feeling or hearing, I just need to broadcast those voting states, like, you know, like the cup, I'm feeling this cup with my finger at, you know, I'm, there's a cup with, at this position relative to my body and the language areas of the brain can, can, can describe that in their language. They can just say, yeah, here's what it is. This is what you're, I'm touching. I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. It's like, this is over here, things like that. In some sense, it, it brings the language areas into the brain, into the same sort of uh, um, uh, set of activities of all the other columns. You know, The language area of the brain can say, I can just describe these things as, as you're experiencing elsewhere in the brain. Whereas if you didn't have this kind of voting idea that there's these, 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 um, these st stable patterns are being broadcast across the cortex, then you'd have to assume that somehow it has to travel through area after area to get to the language areas of the brain. 
Um, but this makes it much easier to sort of conceptualize what language is doing. It's working, it's starting off with these voting uh, states. Um, and, and from that, you can articulate it. And, and similarly, when I hear somebody describe something to me, someone wants to describe what they did, um, it just turns those into these voting states again. And, and so I could say, well, I was standing outside the front door of the office and I looked to my left and I saw someone doing exercise. You could all visualize that just from my language. So, from, you know, so it comes into your brain, your brain interprets it and says, I'll recreate these states right now. And you can visualize what it would look like. And if I said they were sitting on a bouncy ball, you could visualize what that would feel like, or you can imagine what it would feel like. So it, it brings language into this picture. Okay, um, that's it for voting, unless there's questions about it. I have a brief question. Yeah. Um, this might be kind of dumb, but <clears throat> is this voting also responsible for reconciling differences between two objects of the same kind? So when you see a coffee cup, the first thing that you don't think of is that's a coffee cup. You think of that's my coffee cup versus someone else's. Um, yeah. Is that well, that's assuming you've built the model of your coffee cup, right? Um, you've already you've already learned your coffee cup. Yeah. Okay. So um, no object ID in this case, uh, Abby is is includes that specific. Like you know, my I I have a coffee cup next to me right now. It's a green one, and I know this coffee cup I use at home all the time, um, and. I have, a, I have a specific model of that. I don't, I don't need the different, I mean, I have a model of that cup and, and I have models of other cups, but my Nemeth coffee cup is a different model. So I don't need voting to do that. Those are just unique object IDs. If, if it's something I've never seen before, if it's a new coffee cup that I've never seen before, well, then I can't form a stable representation of it right away because it's new, right? And so what you will do then is you'll, you'll attend to the individual components of that new coffee cup. Maybe it's square. Okay, I've never had a square coffee cup, and now I have a square coffee cup. So I'll attend to the individual components of that coffee cup. Look at it. Oh, there's an edge here, there's an edge there, there's a corner here. And those of then are transmitted across the brain. So I can visualize that, even though I don't know. So now I'm just I'm broadcasting a series of, of sub-objects at locations. And, and so you... you I guess my point is what's broadcast is always something you've learned. And if it's a new object you're looking at, then you broadcast the components you're attending to one at a time because you know those components. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I said I, I think it's very clear to me that um, you know, that's the way the world is, right? You you look around and you when you attend to things, you're always attend, you always narrow down your focus until something you you recognize as something you've learned before. And then that's what's going to be voted on, and so I can I can encapsulate an entire coffee cup as one thing if I uh, if I've learned it, but if I haven't learned it, I will transmit it as a series of sub objects um, at different locations. That's a good question. Yeah, Alex, did you have a question? I did. Yeah, I wanted to talk about I guess your thoughts on the difference between the sort of long range voting that's going on in layer two, three, and what's happening in layer one as something akin to like a global signal. Um, Cause th when I, when I think of, uh, I, I, yeah, I guess I just wanted to hear what do you think is the difference between those two things, right? Uh, it's a good question. So layer one is very unusual for those who don't know. Um, it has very few cells. It has cells. Sometimes they, people describe it as no cells. That's not true. It has cells. Um, they're very weird looking cells. Um, and, but it's mostly just connections. Uh, you could think of like the white matter underneath the cortex below layer six is just connections. That's what the white matter is. Wires going back and forth all over the place. And in layer one, you have a lot of connections too, although not super long range. So what will happen is for example, well, some of them are, um, but it's, it's also a way of transmitting a signal over many columns. Um, so, a typical example will be um, uh, there's these cells in the thalamus, these called matrix cells, and they project to the cortex. And one of the places they project to is layer one, and they spread over long distances. So these matrix cells are going to send a signal over a large area of the cortex, just like we talked about with the voting neurons. And um, 
I believe those cells are representing uh, timing information. So I need to spread timing information across broad areas of the cortex. Um, and, and the layer one's a good place to do it. And so a lot of neurons in a column will send their apical dendrites up to layer one. So a lot of cells in a column can get that signal from the matrix cells. So that's a broad picture. I think a difference between voting and something like the matrix cells is voting is always between cells of the same type, right? I have this layer 5A cell, let's say, and it exists in all my columns and they are connecting to layer 5A cells. That's it. Voting is between like and like, you know, we're all representing the same thing. We're all gonna come to agreement. Where layer one is, is not like that. Layer one signals are spread long distances, but they're not from cell type to cell type. It's not like what layer one cells are connecting to layer one cells. It's not, it's like matrix cells are connecting to lots of other cells or, you know, uh, neuromodulator releasing cells are connecting to lots of other cells, that kind of thing. It's, it's like a broadcast medium, but it's not a voting medium. Um, and, and it is a lot of mystery about layer one. Um, a lot of things project broadly up there. Right. Uh, uh, another example would be um, rhythms. You know, uh, a lot of the theories about how the grid cells work require these theta rhythms and some of the theta, the theta rhythm is generated in the thalamus. And so, you know, I don't remember what we know about this, but one way you could, you could distribute that would logically be in layer one. You'd say, okay, every, everyone's gonna be exposed to these rhythms and, um, um, but it's not voting. Right. Yeah. So when, when you mentioned um, something like a knowledge transfer between something like uh, language columns and other columns, I could tell you like, hey, there's something next to your right foot and you'll feel it with your right foot, right? Yeah. And that's not like the language is voting along with whatever columns are attached to your right foot. It's more like your right foot knows what the sense because of the language, which is why I thought that kind of global signal was more, more appropriate to happen in layer one, as opposed to a strict voting mechanism. In layer well, one. that's a good observation. Although, you know, I'm, what I'm, what I start off by saying, let's just talk about voting and I can deduce that voting has to include object ID, object state and object pose, right? I can just can conclude that that's, it's there. That's voting or doing that. And the question is, what could I do with those signals? And mm -hmm. When I talk about transfer learning, I, I really focusing on this joint, just joint pooling things here. Whereas, like, how is it that I'm able to, you know, learn something with my finger and then recognize it visually, or learn it with my left finger and then recognize it with my right finger? I mean, that's a fundamental problem with the thousand brain theory. We knew it had to be solved, and now I have a solution to it. Mm -hmm. I threw in the language stuff um, because I only because it's very um, it's very suggestive. Uh, as I said, it's just like, oh, you know, a lot of language is describing the same things. Like you said, like imagine something left to your, next to your foot and, and imagine there's a little, you know, pin cushion there. And, you know, and you can visualize this. You can imagine what it would feel like. And so, but I'm describing physical artifacts that, you know, in relative poses to your body. And, and you can just, by just my language, I instate that same state state of visualization in your brain. And so that system like, well, voting, that sounds a lot like what I just described voting is doing. Um, so I don't, I'm not saying that's it for language. I'm just saying that it seems like that's a big component of it. So I just want to leave that as a, it's a again, this, this, that'll be, a language is not something we focused on a lot, but, but it seems like I had a, a new foot in the door on it, if you will, but think about voting. And, and you're right, there may be other things too, but clearly just the, the ability to visualize, imagine any a sensory perception based on another sensory, a real sensory perception can influence imagined sensory perceptions. There's a lot of what language is. It's just recreating states in your brain that I have in my brain. So language in some sense is an extended voting system. I can, I can imagine being seeing something, I, turned that into language just describes the exact same things that I'm, my neurons are voting on. Now your neurons are voting on it and, and or they're sending a signal around. They're not voting. They're just sending that signal around saying, yes, we're all, imagine you're seeing this, you know, pin cushion next to your foot and bingo, there it is. <laughs> yeah. So they're yeah. not, they're not voting in the sense of trying to reach a consensus, but the mechanism could be a way of spreading, spreading um, uh, states of, perception mm -hmm. 
right? So not voting, your, your brain's not voting when I describe something visually to you, but you could be using that same mechanism to say like, hey, there's no bottoms up input for this, but given our horizontal voting connections, we can all reinstate this condition and you can imagine it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'm <laughs> satisfied with that answer. Yeah, I mean, we have to sometimes just be willing to accept that we don't understand things completely, but, but if, but again, I'm really excited about this because it is a, a, it's a, it feels like a very deep insight to me that that you know in some sense language is just a way of voting between brains. It's it's it's, it's sort of the same mechanism. <laughs> so all I have to do is get my perception, you know, what I'm perceiving to the language area of the brain, just like I'm spreading around to everybody. The language area of the brain converts it into into a verbalization, which then recreates the state in your brain. So. Um, so that's something like that. Anything yeah. else bef before I go on? Um, yeah, uh, so regarding this cross modal transfer, um, imagining something that a different column is perceiving, does this mean um, if a column from a different modality gets the voting signal, let's say from a touch column, and now wants to visualize it, is this only on the level of the level two, three voting? Cells, or would this mean that they also change the states of the layer four? Um, I, I, well, I think they wouldn't change the states of layer four. Layer four is the is the classic input layer, right? And my thinking, and it is, um, you know, this is just my speculations, Vivian. But my thinking is, and I think most neuroscientists would agree that layer four represents reality, right? It's it's like this actually happened. <laughs> you know, this is the real thing. Um, you remember the voting neurons. They have, they have this contextual input and they have a bottoms up input, right? So when I'm talking about spreading this information, there is no bottoms up input, it's just contextual input. And so we can reinstate the state in the voting neurons from contextual input, but there's no, there's no it's not fighting with the, it, there's no bottoms up input saying, no, what really is happening is X. So therefore this column really can't vote, it's just being given the contextual input. Um, I don't think it would invoke the layer four cells to become active because that, that would mean that the, then the column would have no way of knowing what's real and what's imagined. You know, we kind of have to say like, yeah, we have, we have this hypothesis that what's out there is the following thing, but if you're getting layer four input, then how would any neural tissue know that it's not real? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I kind of reserve layer four for like, you know, ground truth. <laughs> so, so can it somehow make use of the model knowledge that it has in layer four about objects? Well, let's let's not assume we know what's going on in layer four right now. It, it would have to, I think it would have to make, it has to take advantage of the models in the column. But, you know, as I'm gonna talk about in a second here, our thinking about how columns uh, create models uh, was an error. It, it, we got a, lot, a bunch of things wrong. So. Uh, let's not assume at this moment that we know what layer four is doing. <laughs> okay. It's obviously getting input. It's representing it in context. That's all true. Um, but when you start extending it to like what part of the model does layer four represent, I don't want to go there yet. I want to, I'll come back to that. Okay. So we can, we can invoke the model in the column. We will definitely do that. Cause I can say, imagine you're looking at the Nementic coffee cup. We can all visualize it right now. So you all have that model in your head. Uh, you're all looking at it. I can say, now look at it from the top, looking straight down into the center, and now look at it from the bottom. Look straight. You can all do that. So, um, but none of us is getting layer four input. And I would say that your layer four cells are probably aren't doing anything when you're doing that, but you're invoking that model of what the, vision, of what the, court, uh, the, the cup looks like. So um, that gets down to the details of how the model is implemented in the core of a column which is a good time to move to the next topic, <laughs> if I can. Uh, but I'm happy to answer more questions on this topic before I leave. I do have one, but we can skip for now. No, no, go for it. Um, so you said the model of my coffee cup is different than the model of your coffee cup. And oh, mean, meaning my, like I have a, a cup you don't have. Yeah, so you're building two different abstract models of two different coffee cups, but does it mean I'm gonna build a third, a fourth, a fifth. Where does the generalization come from? All right. This is a coffee cup. Let's let's get to that. That's about model building. Okay. That's not about voting per se. So let's just say that in the voting, 
there has to be um, within my brain for columns to vote, they have to all have experience at some point, a commons structure so that my fingers know what an edge look feels like and my visual columns know what an edge looks like and so on. Um, and maybe, let's talk, let's talk about how we build models in that in the next section. Maybe I should point out also that the exact models that are in different cortical columns, different cortical columns are not going to have the exact model of the same object either. The you know the yeah. fact, somatosensory cortical columns are going to be quite different from the visual cortical columns. They just need to be able to associate. Um, in order to be able to vote, you need to be able to associate these representations together. Yeah, that's a good point. I could say. I could say, okay, there's a, uh, a rounded edge on top of this object and you can, all, you can visualize that and you can imagine what it feel like. But if I said the rounded edge was yellow, you couldn't imagine what that feels like. Um, you know, you just couldn't do that. <laughs> you can't vote on that. So my visual, uh, there's, there's a, a visual percept or visual object that I, I, I can't uh, feel. Um, so there's things I can't, they're not identical. And there's things I can feel that I can't see. So. Um, yeah. Um, but, but I think you're asking a different question. Yeah, I think Herman. so too. Uh, but let's go on and, and uh, we, we can revisit that. Yeah, I think we need to, we're going to go into like the basic, what it means to model something. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and, I, and that might, it, it will expose more questions and problems. So, um, so we say columns learn models, but what is a model? You know, what is it? <laughs> and our understanding of this has been evolving. So, um, and you'll see uh, the latest evolution of it. We started off, and I talked last time about the columns paper. Remember the big thing about the columns paper was there were two big ideas in the columns paper. One is that individual columns could learn models through movement. And the other one was the voting idea. Now we proposed and, and actually did a simulation of how the model would be created. In the model we did in the columns paper, I would call it a feature model. I just made that up. And, and the feature model says uh, a model of, the, of an object is a set of features at locations. That's how we described it in that paper. So as you move your finger around the coffee cup, you discover features at different locations in some reference frame. And, um, and that's how you build up. It's a set of those features at locations. Um, that was, there was a lot of issues with that, but that was what the best we could do at that time. And we we're pretty excited about it. Um, but again, the main thing we were trying to do in the paper saying that it could be done. You could learn a model of the world uh, through movement and individual columns could do that. So, but we knew there were some big problems with that. So we tried to address some of those problems in the frameworks paper. In the frameworks paper, we proposed a different type of model. I'll just call this one a compositional model. Okay, so what this was, he says, okay, an object isn't a set of features, but an object is a, or a model is a set of displacements between component objects. And so, so objects, a model of something is built of a set of other things in some relationship to each other. And the example we used was in the logo on the coffee cup. Um, and we say, yes, I don't, I don't need to, uh, when, I, when I learned this new coffee cup, I, I learn it as there's a logo at some position relative to the to this to a, a cylinder or to a coffee cup, and now I have a new object composed of a logo and a coffee cup. It's compositional, and then everything would be like that. Everything you know is composed of other things in relative positions. In that paper, we suggested that the locations are based on multiple grid cell um, uh, uh, module reference frames. I'm missing the word module there, and we derive we propose how these displacements would be calculated. And, and they were derived from grid cells. So in the little, on the left there, we said there would be some number of grid cell modules. And for every grid cell module, there'd be a displacement cell module. And we showed how this would work. And, um, and, and then what would happen is as you attend to an object, let's say the, the logo, and then you attend to another object, such as the, the cylinder of the cup, um, what, every time you attend to a new object, the displacement cells would calculate the displacement between them. And so by inferring the logo and inferring the cylinder, you automatically displace, uh, calculate the displacement between those two. And the idea is as you go around the world and you look at things one at a time, you're constantly calculating displacements between them. That's just, it's just like a nonstop thing. 
So, but the model we proposed was based on grid cell modules. Um, and we had to assume that each column had a, a set of grid cell modules, and then it had an equivalent one-to-one -one corresponding set of, of displacement cell modules. There are a lot of benefits to this kind of uh, competition model and the way we described it in the framework paper. Uh, one is it's one-shot learning. You know, to build a new object out of two other objects, it just requires two attentional moments, attend to the logo, attend to the cup, and, uh, and now I, I can learn the entire relationship. Um, it's very efficient in storage. In, in this particular thing, you can imagine there's a cell active in each, in each displacement cell module. So let's say I had 20 displacement cell modules. There'd be 20 active cells. This is a very rough approximation. And um, that, those 20 active cells would represent, that's all you take to represent the logo on the coffee cup. Uh, it's very, very efficient. I only have to form 20 new synapses, in, if you will, to form this new relationship between these two objects. And it happens very quickly, it happens instantaneously, it, there's no extra effort, it happens every time you attend to anything. Um, and then, so it's very efficient in storage and, and, it, and it enables continuous learning because you're continually calculating these displacements. You never stop in your life, you know, when you're awake. And so the example I use in the book and we've used in the office a few times, is you know you're you walk into you sit down at the dining table and you look and you see where the you know the, the bowl of potatoes mashed potatoes are and the green bean, beans and where the wine bottle is and you just look at them one 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 and now you've built up a model of where those things are on the table and so if I said close your eyes and tell me you point to the you know the green beans you can do it you've already built you know where it is you've built this model of the table just by glancing at things and knowing where things are relative to everything else and so we may not remember that for very long. Um, but I form those memories constantly. We, we all do, just constantly. Just where did I leave my glasses? You know, what did I just do here? What, you know, all these things. So it's a sort of a, a part and parcel of continuous learning, independent of the, the mechanism of dendrite. It's just saying um, it provides a structure for learning uh, sort of your uh, uh, models of the world continuously just by tending to things. So that was all really cool. Uh, but there were a bunch of problems uh, with the compositional model as described in the frameworks paper. I wanna make a distinction. Uh, the compositional model is right, but the, as we described in the frameworks paper, is had some problems. And as I mentioned last time, the displacements, they didn't represent orientation and scale. There was no way to say, oh, the Nementa logo is at an angle on the coffee cup. It's at a 45 degree angle, or that it's a small logo or a big logo. We had no way of doing that with our displacement cells. Another big problem with the frameworks paper is that it required many grid cell modules. We were, we were relying on this idea that you, you're going to be sampling across multiple grid cell modules that were slightly different. And this is how you came up with this unique location. And our displacement cell mechanism required that too. The problem with this is the evidence we had suggested that couldn't be. That um, the best knowledge we have, and it's partial information, I would argue that there's probably one grid cell module per column. That's what, would, that's what the evidence would suggest. And we need, you know, I would ideally would want 20. Uh, maybe I could get away with eight or 10, but you can't get away with two. And, uh, you know, one, forget it, it's not gonna work. So we really scratched our heads over this for a long time, looking for evidence on this. And, and we only evidence we really had was from the hip, it's from the enterocortical cortex, but the evidence suggested there that a, a grid cell module was, is about the size of a cortical column. And um, unless you stack them all up on top of one another, it, it's, it just wasn't gonna work. So that was a problem. Uh, and then another problem is that, um, uh, which is somewhat related, um, is that we still didn't, under, we couldn't explain how you could learn or sense or infer from a distance. Like the whole system was built on the idea that the, the column knows where your finger is relative to the object you're touching. Um, but when you're looking at something, your eye is not on the object, it's at a distance from the object. And so how do we reconcile that? And that's true for hearing as well. So that was another problem we didn't address in that paper. So those are some pretty significant problems, but there are also some really cool ideas in the frameworks paper. <laughs> you know, compositional models and this one-shot learning, efficient storage, all that seemed right. It just seemed too good to not be correct. Um, yet we had these fundamental problems. So, so now I'm gonna talk about modeling from a different perspective and point out where our error was. Um, and before I do, is there any questions on this slide? Do you think it's important? I'm not suggesting no, but at a later point, do you think it's important for people to understand how multiple 
grid cell modules work together? Are we completely moving away from that anyway? So it's not. That's an interesting question. And maybe Marcus, you could answer this question because um, I need to spend more time thinking about this. You're going to see in a moment that we're going to swap out grid cell modules for, um, uh, for vector cell modules. And the question then becomes, do I need multiple vector cell modules um, in the same way we needed multiple grid cell modules? And I was thinking about this all last night in my sleep uh, about this very specific topic. Um, and I haven't reached a conclusion yet about it, uh, but oh, okay. I don't know. That's fine. I don't know if Marcus, if you have a strong opinion about that. Uh, at the moment, my bias is that like the combinatorial modules thing, um, my guess is it's probably not right. <laughs> but but that's just what you're, that's the sample yes. of me today. So that, I would, that would be my guess too. Okay. Um, because, because only because we have to fit this all in a column. <laughs> and I can easily imagine fitting one of these modules in the column. That's no problem. I know we have to do that, but getting a lot of them. And so there's, there's a, for those, many people won't understand this comment, but this is what Supertype is getting at. Um, we require multiple modules as a way of um, sort of taking a representation, like a grid cell module doesn't represent a lot. And in order to make it rich enough, we had to create multiple modules. But there's another way of creating richness from a simple representation. And that is the, uh, the temporal memory model. That is the idea that you have a mini column of cells and you pick one, this, the column represents something, but you pick one cell in each of the active columns and then you get a much higher representational space. That's, that's our context. Um, and I'm trying to see if the whole model can work just using that, which would be much more elegant. Um, that is that what we're going to end up with. You're going to see. Well, we're we're going to eventually see that the column is going to it's going to have grid cells, and it's going to have vector cells, but maybe the combination of them together along with the mini column trick of that would be sufficient. So that that's my guess right at the moment, but I don't know. But okay. we should we'll come let's, back to uh, it well, another let's time. That, the Combinatoric stuff was really cool. <laughs> it is cool and it's necessary. So it's like we gotta gotta figure this out. But well, we know the, well, we, the we, temporal memory has its own combinatorics and it enables much. I mean, I don't know if this you'll get there or not, but it enables unions to a much greater extent. Yeah, yeah. Which is well, really critical for results. This is a big yeah, constraint in the columns plus paper was the unions of the location module. So an, well another the another thing was yeah, that's a big constraint. Another thing is on the on the mini column um, temple memory trick, right? We have a mini ten cells that say all represent the same thing. You pick one to be active and needs a mini columns. There's a huge amount of empirical evidence supporting that, and um, and so I feel comfortable that's actually happening. And it, and then I can easily extend and say, well, that could be happening in each cellular layer. That would be a really obvious extension because the the, the inhibitory cells are there. Everything is there to support that. The idea that you have multiple modules, like multiple grid cell modules and multiple spacing cell modules, we have almost no empirical support for that. And the empirical support we have says, suggests it's not true. So, so it, that alone would suggest like, yeah, we're probably gonna have to abandon that. Even though it's so damn cool the way it worked, it was, it was so, we got so enamored with it. By the way, we didn't invent that. Um, one of you could tell us who invented this, the idea that multiple grid cell modules combined together creates this really rich uh, space. Um, we just adopted that from someone else. Someone else published that. And we said, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Who was that? I mean, I think multiple people thought of it. The, the biggest one that proposed it was Ela Feet's What Grid Cells Convey About Rat Location from 2008. Uh -huh. That was probably the, the first one that like really wrote it up really well. Yeah, well, we fell for it because it seems so good. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I did see a review paper by the Mosers where they had this like combination lock picture. Um, that might yeah. have been after Elaf. That was in 2014. So, like, the okay. idea has really stuck around. It's not like it was abandoned. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, the you know, that's the Roland and my Brit Moser one you're talking about. And yes, so it's a popular idea still. Well, yeah. we're, I mean, well, it's, it's a beautiful idea. It's. it's I think it's. I think we're going to toss it because it's yeah. it's um, <laughs> as beautiful it is. I mean, we fell for it, um, but it led us down a path. And I'm going to describe how we got down that path uh, in a moment here. Um, but any more questions on this particular slide? Or anything yeah, you just- Yeah, um, I want to throw up a straw man. 
because uh, I expect it's going to be knocked down easily, but I'd like to uh, ask it anyway. So uh, when you said that you're trying to fit an entire model into a cortical column and you need multiple grid cells, if you were going down that path, you'd need that to represent the model. Uh, what if you relaxed one of the constraints that a large portion of the model is within the a single cortical column, but for things that require the combinatorics, it's actually distributed. So it's not totally in one. Yeah, I, I guess, totally I mean, it's kind of, it's one of these things you, you know, you can't, you know, divide a baby in half and treat the two halves separately. You know, it's, it, I mean, either you, it, it's, it's like, I don't know what the in-between is. Either you, columns are all, columns are all doing the same thing. Right, so we, let's accept Mountcastle's proposal. Mountcastle said every column is doing the same thing, and therefore the correlate of that is everything the cortex does is done by every column. That's a logical follow-on to Mountcastle's proposal. And so it's kind of hard to go halfway. It's either you reject the whole thing and say, no, he's wrong. You know, different parts of the cortex are doing different things. It's a hierarchical thing. You know, the model of the coffee cup only exists in higher levels. It doesn't exist in these lower levels. Then you're back to square one. That's what, that's what most people think today. I don't see how you. I, 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 so I don't see how to to be half pregnant. You know what I'm saying? It's like you go for it, you don't. And and at the moment, I don't want to throw it away, Kevin, because I'm I'm absolutely confident we can build the entire model in a column. So I, you know, I, if if I have to be a really really backed into a corner where the logic proves that it couldn't happen before I'm willing to abandon it. Uh, it's so, it's it's just too good. I I, I will say that uh, that the the idea Kevin just brought up, just in case. Uh, so in the columns plus paper, the one that did the grid cells and the moving and stuff, uh, I made sure to include a result where we did use only one module and showed that um, it actually can still move around and infer a location. Uh, but it, it of course can't make predictions. It can't make unique predictions, but like the model actually can work in a single module version and do something like what Kevin's saying. Well, it can uh, work with- it I, can... I included that just in case. Yeah. We, we eventually embrace something like this, but- uh, But so, it, so... It, it, it works without working because like if it can't make predictions, well then we're good is it, right? It's like, right. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it'll half work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the fact that you have a richness of communication between the columns, some of which you you said these are mysteries about what these things actually do. So there's... Uh, I didn't say there were mysteries. Uh, I mean, which were you talking about the voting connections or the other connections like the... the uh, you part? were talking like layer one, you said yeah. there's a mystery about what happens there that you had a, a well, hypothesis that it could be timing. I, when right. I say it's a mystery, I mean, uh, there's a lot of data about it, but it's, uh, we have a hypothesis of some of the components, but not all of them. Uh, it's not okay. like, oh my God, there's this huge thing that we, we can't explain. There's all kinds of stuff that, you know, have to fit in eventually. Now, I, I'm not willing to go there yet, Kevin. I mean, it's a reasonable question, but um, I think as theorists, you've got to take the, the elegant ideas and go with it until you're proven wrong. And um, that's the way you do. If you if you start questioning everything, you, you just you can't make progress. It, and and but, you know and, and you can be proven wrong. We're going to see in a moment that we went with the elegant idea of grid cells being the reference frame for creating models of objects, and it was wrong. <laughs> so, but okay. we it, we had to, it, it took a lot of persuasion to get us to that conclusion. But now that we know we know exactly why it's wrong, we we have details of it. We can understand the problem. Of what we went with, so I'm not willing to abandon this yet. There's no, there's no point in that. Uh, I'm very confident. Okay. Well, I'm, 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 I'm willing to accept the fact that that the that that is is no sense in just apply Occam's razor into this. That yeah. There's no, yeah. That, that you might as well, if you if you can explain everything as a, as an isolate cortical yeah. column embodying the model. Uh, until you're forced to abandon that, uh, proceed along those lines. So remember, I, I said the, it's a straw the, man that I put the Thrasen brain theory doesn't say that there isn't any hierarchical connections in the cortex. That, it doesn't say that. Um, and there are right. Well, I, and, I, I, wasn't, and, uh, I was even yeah. suggesting hierarchical. I yeah, was just well. suggesting a common milieu that some operations are happening with through. Yeah. Sometimes. Okay. Well, it's a good thing to ponder, but I'm not going to ponder it for too long. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, we got this, it's, it's, the thousand brain theory, it's really, it's, it solves so many constraints. It's just, 
it just you, we want to fight for it, um, and um, and I and I think well it'll turn out to be right. I'm very confident in that. Um, but let's talk about this. We we did we did realize all along the way in both the columns paper and the frameworks paper and the columns plus paper, we knew there were problems. We knew that we identified them. We didn't hide them as, as as well as we could. We at least put them in the discussion sections and said, you know, doesn't work. <laughs> I think we talked about the issues of displacement cells. I think we might. I don't know if we talked about the issues too many grid cell modules, but but we knew these things. We weren't hiding it from anybody. Um, but it didn't, you know, we didn't want to let this stop us in our tracks. We said, okay, there's some things that are right about this. And, and I'm featuring those things, you know, like a compositional model is correct. That is how the world is structured. And, and so if we didn't get it right the first time, we'll get it right the second time. Um, and the benefits of competitional models are correct. Um, so it's like, okay, let's refine our models. Let's go on. So let's just talk about models. I've shown these slides a couple of times. Maybe some of you have seen it, but let's just go through them again. This is the model. You know, what's a model? This is a model. This is a physical model that an architect might make of a house. And, um, and then why do we build models like this? We build models like this because it allows us to see the structure before it's built, what it would look like from different angles. We can say what it looks like in this position, what it looks like in that position. You can imagine standing on the terrace and saying, what would my view be if I look in this way and that way? You can also use it to solve problems. You could say, well, if I want to get from the driveway to the pool, what would be my path to get there? Um, and what obstacles might I have, uh, and things like that. So that's where we build models like that. But now we often we build them in computers. So here's a model, uh, a computer, a, a model of a house that was designed on a computer. It solves the same thing. We basically can say, what does it look like from this direction? What does it look like from that direction? How do I get from point A to point B? What does it look like from this direction? So how are models like this built in a computer? Uh, it's very simple, as we all probably know. Um, they define a reference frame um, for the house in this case. They, they, this reference frame will have an anchoring point, a zero point, if you will, in Cartesian coordinates. We place it at the corner of the property, perhaps. And uh, now with that reference frame, we can locate things relative um, uh, to, you know, and we can place things in the house. Now, the way this works is if I want to place a door in the house, I don't specify the location of every component of the door. In fact, I have another model of the door, which has its own reference frame, uh, reference here in green. And, and now I locate uh, that reference frame at a location in the blue reference frame. So like, oh, the door is at this location relative to the corner of the property, let's say. Um, now, but let's think about it. So a model like this, a computer model or any model is a set of objects at relative locations, but you can even see right here, the problem of orientation and scale come in as well. For example, that garage door could be at a different orientation. It could be facing the side of the house. Uh, it could be at a 45 degree angle to the corner of the house. Uh, it could be sloped back slightly because maybe the wall was tilted or something like that. Um, and it could be at different sizes. I, I might want to have a big garage door and a small garage door. So, you know, when we're specifying a model like this, we have to specify the location of the object. The object itself is represented by a reference frame, and we have to specify the orientation of that reference frame at that location and the scale of that object that we're going to place at that reference frame. And that's how computer models are built, right? Exactly like this, um, uh, using reference frames, these Cart Cartesian coordinate type reference frames. Um, and just to reiterate, objects such as the door, so a house is a set of objects, and the uh, an individual objects such as the door are also models uh, composed of sets of objects. Also, at now relative locations, orientation, and scales um, compared to the green reference frame. So it's a compositional model, uh, like we were talking about with the coffee cup. Now, we had deduced that models in the brain are also constructed this way. We were confident of this. We are confident of it. It was a deduction that this is the way models are built in the brain. But when I say this is the way they're built in the brain, I mean specifically that the column of models are sets of objects at relative locations, orientations, and scales. That all comes, we can see all that just coming right from the coffee cup with the logo. Those issues are there right from the start. Um, but just to be clear, you, you don't mean we use Cartesian coordinates. No, all right, right. I'm getting that point right away here. I say specifically, what am I saying they're the same? They're compositional in that way only. They're compositional that a set of, a model is a set of objects at relative locations, orientations, and skills. Now we get to the problem. We made a fundamental error. Um, we had already deduced that columns 
have a metric reference frame made of grid cells. We deduce this from the, the, thing, the thought experiment about moving your finger relative to the coffee cup. That told us if you can predict where your finger is going to be when it moves, that tells us there had to be a metric regular type of reference frame, not necessarily a Cartesian coordinate reference frame, but grid cells we hypothesize, because path integration requires it. Path integration requires a, a reference frame like that. There's no other way you can say, I'm moving my finger you know, in some, from point A in some direction, and I've never done this specific movement before, but I want to be able to predict where I'll be in that reference frame. Uh, you know, I need, a, I need a reference frame for that. And so we, we deduce that the reference frames must exist. We hypothesize that they would be built on grid cells. And now we know there are grid cells in every cortical, in the, they're finding grid cells in cortical columns. So that's all great. We, we're confident about that. But honestly, the reason, the only thing we know for certain is that path integration, which, which columns can do, requires reference frame. But then we made the assumption that models in a column were based on grid cell metric reference frames, like the computer model. Now, they're not Cartesian. The grid cell model we, we did with multiple grid cell modules, there is no coordinate, there's no zero, zero point. Uh, there's some significant differences, but in some sense, they have the same quality. They're, they're metric, that is, you can determine the distances from any point and any other point. Um, there's this regular structure like a, like a Cartesian coordinate system. Um, and so we were going with that. Um, and we were trying to figure out how to make them work in 3D and all the issues associated with that. But that was a logical assumption. We just said, okay, we know that we're gonna have these compositional models. We know they're gonna kind of have these objects composed of reference, you know, objects composed of other object orientations. We knew there was already a metric reference frame in each cortical column. So da -da, that's how they're built. But that was a mistake. The solution, and Marcus gets credit for this, um, the solution is that models are not built using grid cell reference frames. Uh, models are built using a different type of representation, these vector cell modules. Um, and you, they're, they're more like polar coordinates, okay? They're, and um, they're, not, they're not like these are Cartesian coordinates. Uh, and this came up before, these cells exist throughout the hippocampal complex, they're very commonly found. They're all different types of them. They're very prevalent. So we know these cells also exist. Um, and that, as Marcus proposed, the displacements now are not derived from changes in grid cell modules, as we proposed in the frameworks paper, but are derived from vector cells. That you can calculate a displacement between two vector cell representations, a displacement in some sense in polar coordinates, um, and, uh, and that's where the displacements are derived. So the whole model is built around these vector cells. So why do we have grid cell reference frames? Well, we still need to do path integration of movement. And so the, the basic theory is that we built these models using these, you know, that we can represent the relative position of structures, the, the sub models to each other, but we're gonna re represent them using these more polar coordinate like uh, 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 representations, and um, and we're going to calculate the displacements using differences between these vector cells, and yet we still have to have a reference frame because when when I move, I'm going to I still have to figure out like if I'm moving straight, where am I going to be <laughs> after I move for you know one second at this speed? I need a I need a, uh, a metric reference frame for that. So the, so the grid cell plays a sort of an ancillary role here. It's not an integral part of the model. Um, it, it, you know, where my sensor is at any point in time and, and um, is not really important to the model. This is a model that's independent of my particular uh, viewing position. Um, and, but I do need to have uh, grid cells to track where my sensor moves as it moves around the, the model, but it's not part of the model itself. And that's the big insight that, uh, that Marcus had. Um, Marcus, do you want to, did I say anything that you would want to add to or change? No, I mean, it, you, it's, it's essentially what I what I would have said. Okay, I, you don't describe it in the exact very same words, but um, this is what it was for me. Now, I have a set of slides that walk you through how this is done, um, but I didn't finish them. I just didn't get them done, and so they're not finished. And I'm not going to um, uh, I'm not going to tell you the unfinished slides. I think I think there might be enough for one day anyway. Um, so this is like the cliffhanger, okay? <laughs> so, 
right? We've abandoned our old ways. We now have the new ways uh, that, that Marcus has proposed. And I'm gonna try to, uh, next time, I would like to walk through step by step, what, you know, what do we know about this? Um, and- uh, Would it be uh, possible to at least describe vector cells and their properties in some sort of a- Yeah. Um, that, that, that whole stuff is still a little bit fuzzy in my head. Okay, exactly. I, I, I can- I can vector cell? What are their properties? Okay, are okay, so cells? let me let me do that, but I'm gonna have to visualize. I'm not gonna show you a picture. Maybe Marcus, you can find a picture to show, but um, let me visualize it. Let me describe it visually for you, and then maybe Marcus can show you a picture of it. Um, um, so imagine we have, let's start with a grid cell module, right? A grid cell module is a bunch of cells that are arranged in some, you know, two dimensional arrangement or area. And these cells become, there's a bump of activity in these cells, which represents where you are in sort of a, almost like a Cartesian coordinate, but it's limited scope. It only, you know, and so it can only represent a certain area before it repeats. So an individual cell active in a, in a grid cell module will tell you where you are within some area of space, but then the whole thing is repeated uh, in as you keep going further and further distance. So individual cells in a, in a grid cell module can't, they can tell you something about your location. You can say, well, you're in one of any of these locations equally spaced out on a grid, but you can't tell which one of them. So that's, a, but that's, the, that's what grid cells represent. Now imagine I had a, another set of cells maybe the same area and size. But now these cells represent, um, they can represent all space. Uh, and here's how they do it. You can imagine I have some cells that represent um, uh, uh, that there's something like, a, 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 they're representing a, a, a position of, of relative to me. I'm in, the, I'm in some place and I can have a cell that says, oh, this cell represents a location that's at 30 degrees from you and one center a meter away. And I might have a whole set of these cells that represents uh, one centimeter away from me. Like, okay, there's so that's 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 80 degrees, not, you know, that kind of thing, go around the circle. So I got a set of cells now that some of my vector cells, they all represent um, a position relative to me at some distance. Now I have another set of cells um, that represent the same sort of uh, angles, but further away. But the 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 but the, the, maybe the first cells represent anything between zero and one centimeter. The next set of cells represent between one and ten centimeters, let's say. And so now I have a set of cells that say there's something between, well, let's say one and five centimeters, between one and five centimeters away at thirty degrees, and one and five centimeters away at ninety degrees, things like that. And I have another other cells in all in the same module here that make one, some will represent things that are even further away, but with much less precision. So the further away you get, the less precise you can get. So, you know, you're, you're, the cells that represent the furthest distances could say, you know, it could be really far away. I don't know how, you know, anywhere between, you know, 10 meters and 100 meters, I don't know, something like that, uh, but in this direction. So you can imagine these cells arranged in like a little rosette around you. They're saying, okay, when there's something at this direction, this distance, this will become active. And there's something at this distance in this direction, this thing will become active. Now imagine, so that's a grid cell module. It's a, it's a finite set of cells, but in theory can represent all space because the resolution gets very fuzzy the further away you get. So um, they, they don't have this problem of the grid cells have, which are very precisely spaced, but they have a limited range. Here, we basically throw away a lot of resolution, uh, but we can represent all space uh, around When you me. say a 30 degree, so that was helpful. Uh, when you say a 30 degree orientation, from relative, 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 relative to something. To so it could be relative to my body. It could be relative to a room. So typically an object- like a head, a Relative to a head direction. Well, uh, let's say so typically an object vector cell, let's imagine you're a, you're a rat in a room and I'm at some location. And let's say I'm in the, I'm in the uh, so just some location in the room and in some, a little way from me, it's behind me, there is this, um, there's a piece of cheese, right? Now the object vector cells will represent that piece of cheese relative to me, but the, the, the vector cells are anchored to the room in some sense. Um, well, let me put it this way. So now the, the cell says, you know, well, that's anchored to the room, then as you turn around, the cells that are active for that won't change. Well, uh, then, right? I, then it's wrong. It's, it's, it, it's um, I should say it's anchored to me then. What, what will happen is as I turn, um, 
to make me say get this. I hope I didn't get this wrong. Hang a sec. Um, they represent where it is relative to me in the reference frame of the room. So um, the uh, uh, as I turn the um, Oh, gosh, I'm confused because now I'm thinking there's two different types here. Um, I was going to say, and not Marcus, you can help me out, but I was going to well, say. I, I always think the compass rose is a useful thing to bring up here. The, okay, the why compass don't you rose is, well, oh, oh, just saying that the compass rose of your, your sense of direction is anchored to the room. And you're just saying where the object what, is. What do you mean by the compass rose? Okay, maybe that's not clear. It's um, like, it's like. You, you mean like the, the just the. The in, angles, in the north north point. So 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 if I'm standing someplace and 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 the, the object's right behind me, so it's it's pointing at the, the 180 degrees from where I'm facing. As I turn, um, I believe the object the, the the vector cells change. It's it's um, in this case in this case it's relative <clears throat> it's relative to me, but it's it's constant location in the room, right? Um, but I think you could have both. You know, why am I so confused about this, Marcus? Can you help me out on this? If I, I mean, if it I, may, it might be helpful if I show a figure from yeah. The, why don't you do on that? Vector yeah. cell coding. Because now you just I don't know why I'm having trouble with this. So a good uh, review paper on these vector type cells is this one from Bikansky and Burgess, uh, Neuro and Vector Vector Coding and Spatial Cognition. And so I'll show a couple. I'll show a figure from here, and I'll show a figure from uh, this other paper on optic vector cells. Uh, so here's their figure one, uh, where um, where you can skip right to. Well, by the way, the bottom the bottom right there is the thing I was trying to visually describe yeah. to you. Yeah, uh, the the bottom right here, and also you could we could make a point here. Um, so the bottom right is the idea that uh, you have a set of cells that respond to um, when an object is at a certain location uh, relative to you. And one benefit of this type of coding scheme, although this is still speculative, even on the part of this paper, is the idea that the resolution changes as you go further out. Uh, it would be surprising if that weren't the case, but it is still speculative. Uh, and one of the kind of questions, uh, one of the things that varies across these cells, some of them are in the reference frame of the environment where like this direction, what, like going up into the left here, what is that? Is that, is, it, is that in your reference frame? Is that like relative to your eye or is that relative to the environment? Like as you turn around, as you turn around, is this yellow thing making circles around you or isn't it? And the answer is in some cells it does and some cells it doesn't. Oh, some that's why it's egocentric. Good. Okay, oh, that's why that's why I was struggling with it because I was thinking like, oh, there's both, and then I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, so if there's some set of cells where, as you turn around, you know, this the the same set of cells will keep within the code will be the same. It's the same yeah. set of cells that are firing as you turn around the room, and then there's others which are just relative to you. So as you turn around, that thing will be the the set of yellow cells will be going around in a. It, it's, it's, what's, what's confusing, imagine this, this little uh, circular rosette here is anchored on and glued to a room, right? Um, you know, I mean, like one of those yellow um, uh, pentagons. It's, it, it's, and so as I turn, um, uh, there's an object at that point. And as I turn, uh, the, the, the relative, well, excuse me, not the cell, the cells will be changing, but they're representing the, Here's a, here's a way to look at it. As I turn, the active cells will change, but the active cells represent the same location in the room, right? They're, it's changing relative to me, but it's the same location in the room. Um, so yes, the, the representation- but To me, that's just anchor, that then is just anchored to your body. Uh, yeah, but, um, but the whole rosette has to get anchored to the room. Um, it's it's not anchored to my body. It's it's uh, my body's. Uh, I don't know. Is that right? Maybe I said is that wrong. Marcus, I mean, there's going. a space around me. You know, uh, 
you know, it, there's a reference frame centered on me that's surrounding me. And that as I turn where different objects are on that reference frame will change. Uh, yeah, but, it's changing, but I mean, it's, it's representing still, the, th the thing that it's representing, even though it's changing relative to you is stable in the environment, right? So, yeah, but, right. But it's still, if it's changing as I turn, then it's, it's, it's in my reference frame, not yeah. in the room's reference yeah. frame. What, one and if there's another set of cells that's in the room's reference frame, then it should not change as I turn around or even as I move around. Yeah, what, one piece of terminology some robotics people might be able to relate this to is an occupancy grid or an occupancy map. There's a lot in common with that. And, and those can similarly either be in like the room's reference frame or in yourself's reference frame. It's the same general idea if that helps anyone. I mean, we have the same issue with grid cells, but we won't really talk about it. It's, it's sort of the what and the where systems. You know, I need to know path integration relative to my body, and I need to do path integration relative to the object I'm sensing. And um, yeah, this, so both of those exist. Yeah, and, and I separate, think then that makes that's. Fine. I think I think that's what we're saying here too. These would both exist. Yeah. The same principles apply here. You can put it you know, that way. I'm trying to go see how far I can go with it. To say. Substitute, you know, vector modules for grid cell modules, and um, and see how far you can go. You know, basically, they're they're playing the same roles. Yeah, I I could just leave it at this. I don't need to say that much more here unless you want me to. I think this can maybe supervise the original question, like how do I visualize this? Maybe this picture shows you how to visualize it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it's interesting. It's interesting whether this you, know, you say this is speculative. I, I'd be curious about the the changing in scale because if it's if it doesn't change in scale as suggested in this picture and the way I described it, then you're back to the same problem you had before with with grid cell modules, right? They can't really represent your space correctly, and then you have to somehow overcome that. Um, it's very appealing that they change in scale because, you know, if I have a goal and I'm gonna represent the goal. Um, uh, you know, let's say I wanna get from my front door, uh, in my door in my backyard, I wanna go someplace. Well, if I wanna go just, you know, to the, just a few feet to a chair, uh, I'll have a pretty accurate uh, um, representation of the distance. But if I wanna go from that door to, you know, uh, a fence at the very far end of the yard, my sense of how far to go is not very good, but it doesn't matter. I'll know the right direction to go. I know I have to go a ways. I, I can't say, oh, that's going to be 26 and a half steps. I can just say, it's, you know, it's going to be a you know, certain amount of distance. And that as you get closer, of course, then your resolution gets better and better and better. So the idea that you could have this sort of course uh, sizing uh, is very appealing because you can get the right direction, roughly to get going in the right place, but it, and you'll refine your, your trajectory as you get closer to the, the target. That seems like a very a logical way of doing this. Uh, you, it, 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 you know, the fact that I can't accurately tell you how many feet it is to the backyard fence is not that important. <laughs> Something like that. So there was a time when you were trying to decompose these problems into uh, 1D grid cells or something along those lines. So. Uh, my question is, if, if you're imputing this mechanism as larger generality than just simply locating yourself or objects in reference frame that it applies to more abstract concepts, do you have a view for n-dimensional versions of these vector cells or uh, n-dimensional polar coordinates for these? Well, you know, we, we, had the, we had the same question with grid cells. And you know, let's just review the problem with grid cells. The problem with grid cells is that they look like they're two dimensional, right? And we need three dimensional. And then we're, the, the, there was two questions, there's two ways we could address that. One was like, hey, they're just doing this in rats and rats kind of live in a two dimensional world. So that's what it's gonna look like for a rat. And you know, we shouldn't, you know, maybe they work in 3D for other animals. Uh, or the other possibility is no, grid cells are fundamentally 2D and we have to compensate for that somehow. 
the paper that uh, Marcus did with Merkel was one way of compensating. If you have a whole bunch of grid cell modules, you could show that a bunch of two-dimensional grid cell modules can represent n-dimensional space. But then that, again, requires a lot of grid cell modules, which we don't really think we can do. Um, uh, so those are the two options uh, that to deal with this. And the same, I guess, the same two options would occur here in the vector cell space. You can either say, well, vector cells, you know, as measured in a rat, mostly look like 2D because that's what the world rats live in. And, or maybe they're fundamentally 3D um, and, or no, we have to compensate from somehow. Marcus, I don't know if you know anything about that. If you can comment on that. I guess the way I'd approach this is that, uh, is so th there's kind of two, two fundamental things we want to be able to represent um, when we talk about these vector cells and when we talk about these displacements. Um, one is relation between self and other, and the other is relation between other and other. Uh, and th these models of objects are relations between others and others. And I'll put that aside for a second. Um, we're talking about uh, object vector cells right now and whether it, what happens in with other dimensions. The way I frame the conversation in my head is, um, is you, what you need is an unsupervised learning system that can rep, that can learn relations between self and other. Um, and in the space of 2D space or 3D space, they're just straight up, they're object vector cells. They're, they're these vector cells. That These are the result of that unsupervised but, learning. But the question is, do object vector cells represent 3D space? Are they? That. Uh, that's the question, I think. Uh, Sorry, my bad. Uh, no, no, no I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a straight. I don't have a straight. No, I mean, the question is: it, is it a is it a little compass rose, or is it a sphere of directions and 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 distances? Um, I don't think I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I mean, uh, there, there is a there is a one D equivalent to what you were talking about. And that's direction cosines, which work for n dimensions. And you can think of them as, you know, displacement from some virtual axis or as angles in that axis or a variety of other things. But th that's the reason why I was bringing it on up is, is that- I, didn't, I don't understand that. that. I don't know what those are. Uh, if you imagine in three dimensions, you have several ways of representing a position in three dimensions. One is spherical coordinates, but it's, it's very asymmetric. Uh, another one is saying- Why is it asymmetric? Why is it asymmetric? Uh, one's, one is, uh, is 180 degrees. The other one is 360 degrees scope. Uh, uh, oh, you're saying one module that does this? Or multiple no, no, modules? No, no, I, no. I'm, oh. I'm speaking about abstract coordinate systems. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that direction cosines is if you imagine the x, y, z coordinates in three dimensions, it's the, and you've got some vector out there, direction cosines basically are the angle from each axis to the vector. So you have three direction cosines and they're all the same type of thing. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're symmetric in that sense. And you can extend mm -hmm. that to n dimensions. So I was just wondering if you believe that this mechanism is also works not just for locations, but for more abstract concepts. And okay. if you want to decompose it into 1D, versions of these things that would be a way of doing that. well i think it, it's that's similar to what the um, uh, marcus merkel paper did where they showed you could take you could do with 1d grid cell modules you could do with 2d grid cell modules but you can take multiple grid cell modules and create um representation of three-dimensional space and right I, i'm, I'm so, just trying to get back whether that that 1d decomposition is still an important concept for you well i don't know yet we don't know i mean it's it's well in terms of the brain, I mean, again, we, again, we can differentiate between how someone would build, build this in a, a machine learning architecture from how the brain does it. We don't have to do it the way the brain does it. Um, but in the brain, we, we're trying to figure out like, you know, okay, well, what's going on there? Um, and, uh, you know, and I've, many times we've been through this, I keep forgetting, what did we learn about 3D grid cell modules? Um, I think we learned that they do represent 3D, right? It's a- um, Most likely. Yeah, most uh, likely, like on a bat, you know, so that it would it would formulate more towards the hypothesis that hey, if you study rats, the world's going to look flat, but if you study bats, the world's going to look three dimensional, and so that would be the ideal situation. That then then the um, uh, these object vector modules would represent three dimensions. Actually, the the, the theory I'm working on, which I I never really got through with everybody here, about how 
uh, how the, the cortical column learns of the dimension of its space by observing movements um, would support which support the idea that um, a, a module, whether it's a grid cell module or object vector cell module, would learn n dimensions if that's what the world was. It would learn whatever the dimensional space that it observes, as opposed to um, uh, sort of pre a priori knowing what it would be. So that would be the to me that would be the ideal answer. It's like, hey, you have this model, you have sub, some set of cells. And they're going to go through a sort of spatial pooler type process on inputs relating to movement. And they're going to figure out, okay, well, I'm just going to figure out all the, the movement vectors you have. And if that's two dimensional, it's two dimensional. If it's one dimensional, it's one dimensional. If it's four dimensional, it's four dimensional. <laughs> um, uh, that'd be the nice answer. I'm not, I'm not saying I know that's the answer, but that would be the nice answer. And I have at least a hypothesis how that would come about. Um, so, so, the, so the challenge for you there would be, uh, do you can you still uh, have a metric space drop out of that n-dimensional well, construct? Again, the metric space that we're talking about, like the grid cell metric space, is just to do path integration. It's just to say, oh, I'm going to move in this direction, and that could be n-dimensional too, right? It just says I'm going to move in this direction. I'm going to use grid cells to figure out where I'll be when I move in this direction a certain amount. Um, but but the uh, but the vector modules are how we're going to um, build the model of the object and know where I am relative to it. Um, and so I don't have to use grid cells for that per se. Uh, okay. But there's this there's the dimensionality question. Again, I, the evidence would suggest that we we don't have a lot of modules. Right? So I can easily say, okay, there's going to be a cell, cellular that represents the grid cells, and there's going to be a cellular that represents object vector cells. Maybe there'll be a couple of different types of object vector cells, but I'm not going to have like 20 object vector cell modules to to resolve ambiguity in dimensions or ambiguity in location or anything like that. Um, uh, we'll have to live with that constraint. So in that case, it'd be nicer if these if these modules could handle whatever dimensionality they're thrown at. And I think that's possible. I, theoretically, it's possible. I can see why that how it would work, but um, the evidence for that is, is you know, who knows? <laughs> I don't think anyone. Maybe I'm not sure. Maybe maybe people have done experiments with 3D environments with object vector cells. I don't know. It's, it's tough to do experiments in even 3D, let alone. Yeah, I know. They, they, had to do these crazy, they had to do these crazy bat experiments where they're measuring from these cells as a batch are flying freely around, you know, <laughs> long tunnels and so on. It's like crazy. Um, very hard to do that stuff. And there was a lot of other experiments where rats were climbing walls. Marcus went through some of these papers. Um, and it looked like, you know, there were funny little weird tricks the rats were doing when they went up different heights. It, it wasn't like they were, they were, they weren't they were representing three-dimensional space exactly. It was sort of distorting two-dimensional space in some ways. So, okay. you know, uh, this is where empirical data can be very confusing and uh, misleading or, you know, who knows. By the way, make uh, a sort of random connection to another study. Yeah, um, may or may not be relevant, but it it back in the seventies and eighties, people looked at kind of the coding for motor movements uh, for isocods in the superior colliculus, and essentially what they figured out is that the way populations of neurons code for isocod movements is almost exactly like what you described these vector cells to be. Um, and I can show you one. Were they three dimensional? Well, no, I, isocods would be. Oh, oh, they, oh yeah, two dimensional. But they, yeah, they it, uh, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but they code basically. Um, this panel A shows kind of the map of cells and how they correspond to the movement. And there, it's essentially an angle and an amplitude. Um, so it's, you know, you can see like if you, poke the cells at this B over here, um, you know, you get this movement because it's sort of 20 degrees up and, you know, five degrees amplitude. And then A would be sort of horizontal, but, you know, slightly longer. And this one would be down 20 degrees and even longer. Yeah. So it, it, um, and the reason I bring this up is, you know, if the, the, if the representation for locations and so on in the neocortex is ba fundamentally based on these vector styles representations. It, it's a relatively easy translation then to motor commands. 
yeah um you know to, at least to for isocods in those cases and and there's still scale factors and things to worry about but there may be a very nice correspondence between well and in fact I, I i think this is a, a really uh instructive result because um you know we know that the superior colliculus projects the visual cortex we know that yeah. the efference copy so this is a signal the cortex is getting and and we're trying to the cortex again in the the the, the, the details of how the cortex learns motor behaviors um, in that theory that I've worked through, um, that it has to it has to have a corresponding representation in the cortical column as is coming from the superior colliculus. And so the fact that the superior colliculus is sending a sort of polar coordinate representation uh, means like I don't have to do any sort of you know weird you know geometric uh, gymnastics to convert it into the representation that's in the cortex. If the cortex is also using polar coordinates for all these things. Um, then it's a very easy correlation to learn. Yeah, um, exactly. and so yeah. you know, it, it, this was a big epiphany that came about. You know, it's thinking about what Marcus has proposed to me, all of a sudden realized, oh my God, everything's going to be done in these polar coordinate systems. That's that's the natural representational space for movement. Um, for like, if I want to say, oh, I have to. I'm standing here and I want to go to the kitchen. Well, I have to turn a certain amount and go a certain distance. I mean, that's just that's the way it works, right? And if I want to calculate, like, oh, in my XYZ coordinates, and I want to get to those XYZ coordinates, then I have to do some math to figure out, oh, well, what angle am I going to go and how far am I going to go? You have to do those, you know, little ge geometry test test there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. but with polar coordinates, you don't. It just comes naturally. Um, and uh, it's also interesting. I'll talk about this next time, but. You know, I talked about we haven't really handled orientation, like orientation of the sensor of your finger or your turning your head or things like this. Uh, um, well, we have to path integrate orientation too, right? You know, like I have to say, if I move my eyes to the right at some speed for some distance, where will I be pointing? And this is it, that's a path integration in 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 angle in some sense. And so we have these two competing things. We have to do path integration and changing our orientation. We have path integration and location. And so now the hard part is path integration and location. And we're going to use this crux called the grid cell module to help us figure that out. But all the other orientation changes, all the other path integration happens naturally in some sense with, uh, with vector cells. Um, uh, I used to comment, you know, you, you could, if you want to learn a room, what a room looks like, what's the first thing you do? You, if I put you in the corner of the room, you're not going to walk. You're going to sit in that corner. You can stand there and look around all the different things. Everything you can see from that corner of the room, that's how you're going to build your model of the world. Not by walking around first. You're not going to say, oh, I see the chair here. I'm going to walk over and look at that chair. No, you're going to like, oh, the chair, 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 thing, 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 thing. You can build almost the entire model of the room by just standing in one place and moving your head and changing its orientation. In some sense, that is the, the first, the first um, order approach to learning something uh, visually. Is um, just to, And you can build the entire model that way. I'll show... And, and then only then, well, like, oh, now I'm going to walk over there. Okay, that works too. But now this introduces error of grid cell path integration, um, which is not as accurate, um, but I can do. Uh, so anyway, I don't know if people follow that or not. But <laughs> so it feels like these vector cells are like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> That's how it works. And uh, I don't know if Marcus, have you thought about yet how to actually calculate displacements in vector cells? Well, sure. I mean, just yeah. pairs of uh, like pa pairs of vector cells are going to have a, it's gonna it's gonna be a whole lot like displacements with yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I can see that right. It, just like we, but the problem I always had with the displacement cells is that I always puzzled how we'd learn it. You know, it's simple. It was a simple pairing, but I always felt like hey, how are we gonna learn that? So it seems to me here with the vector cells, there, there ought to be an easy way to learn it somehow. Um, I don't know. Okay, you're right. It's a simple idea, but I guess I was asking how, how's it learned. I think we've we've probably got a long time here. Um, there's other more questions. Just more of a comment, I guess. That I think it could be interesting to try and think of these encodings in like an action-oriented way as well, because I mean, space perception can be very subjective, and it can be very influenced by our action possibilities and the effort that is required to perform a certain action. Um, like there are behavioral studies, for example, if you have to throw a heavy ball, the distance seems further than if you throw a light ball. Um, 
or if you have to reach for an object, it seems further away. If you if it's out of your reach, then if you have a tool that you can use to get it, hmm. um, and it was, for example, also matched with this uh, resolution increasing uh, or decreasing with distance. So if you uh, everything that is in your reach has a pretty high resolution, you can get to it with one grasp. But your mailbox outside, it's like a pretty long action sequence to actually um, get there. So, so I feel like a lot of these things you could in interpret in being um, encoded in an action-oriented way. I mean, that's interesting because the way I've been thinking about how the brain figures out these dimensions, like, you know, the space you're in, is just from that purpose. It's like observing what actions actually occurred. Like, that's how it knows what space is. It says, I have, I can, I can observe actions and those become the basis set for my, uh, my, my spatial dimensions. It's, it's not like there's some sort of pure, you know, uh, geometric space or pure uh, polar coordinate system. It, it's more like, hey, based on the movements I've seen, I'm going to assume those movements traverse space and uh, therefore those will be the basis set of, of my dimensions of uh, space, which is, I think it's very much aligned with what you're saying, Vivian. It's like, in some sense, the dimensions of space are defined by our movements. It doesn't lead to those little weirdo things you were mentioning about, like why why your perception is incorrect. I have no idea about that, but but the idea that the, the basic idea I think you're saying is that space is defined or integrated with movement. I, that's how I interpret what you said. Um, maybe it's not right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, 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 I've come to believe that. I agree. I mean, your first fundamental coordinate system you learn is what's within arm's reach, right? I mean, you and and then if you're if you're sighted. Then there's the correlation of okay i can reach this far and this is how it appears to my eye and you learn all that you have to learn all that so but the, the anything beyond your arm's reach is a prediction yeah and therefore increasingly more problematic so you can you know you can you can refine that you can learn to do better estimation you have stereopsis you have various other mechanisms to to refine that but obviously you know the further away you are you have stereopsis as a limit yeah. to how far it is well let me let me just I'll give you a, if, if people are following this i, I mentioned this before but I'll, I'll build upon that um a more of a mechanistic level let's just think about vision this is how i've been thinking about it you have you have information about flow across the retina that things are flowing not just it's not a, 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 it's more like things are moving not what it is and there's this whole visual system built around that, right? This is the, the Magnus Other system. And so now imagine you have this field of view and you have all these flow bits. And every action you can take represents is represented by every movement action, whether you're turning your eyes or stepping sideways or going forward or going backwards or rotating your head this way. It doesn't matter. Every movement results in a different set of flow bits on your retina. So if you take those flow bits as your data and you run them through a spatial puller, you end up with a, a, a sort of a, a, a representation of all the different types of movements that were observed. The quarter, the quarter column doesn't know what they mean. He has no idea what these things are. It's just a bunch of moving bits and says, okay, I'll take whatever those bits are and I'll run them through a spatial puller and I'll end up with a representation of them in a set of mini columns and, um, each minicom will be a sort of an approximation of one of the types of movement vectors that it observed. It's going to take, there's an infinite continuum of movement vectors, but we're going to parcel it into a set of minicoms. That's what the spatial puller does. And say, so this is my approximation. And each minicom would represent, um, you know, a, a, a commonly or some equally commonly observed set of flow bits. And therefore they represent different pipe types of movement. And then, those same mini columns, if you're following me, they represent like one might be going, one mini column might represent going straight forward, another one goes straight backward, might be turning your head, whatever, things like this. Each mini column has its own layer five cells, which generate movement. And so the, the logical conclusion would be the layer five cells in that mini column are going to represent movement in that direction. So if I want to go, if I want to go the, the, do the same thing, which cause all the flow bits to come out like this, which we would say would be going forward, 
there's be a mini column that represents that flow bit and say, my cell is going to represent when I want to move like that, I'm going to be active and I will, that I will, that will, what, what I represent, I move, I represent that set of movements. And, and so now you have a, a, a basis set of all the movements that represent all the different types of patterns you've observed. And, and, and now you can reconstruct movements by assembling a set of these basis vectors over time. And, you know, like I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to turn my head and go up and down and do this. So this basic idea would apply to any sensory modality. It doesn't have to apply just to vision. It's, it's a basic fundamental property of observing movement through space, uh, not knowing what it means, partially laying out into a bunch of basis vectors, one per mini column. Those mini columns represent that. Now I can create movements too, because I can just, re I can just string together the things I've observed. So that's the basic idea. Uh, and that's why I say it could learn n dimensions, because as long as it's represented in the flow bits, <clears throat> um, of, of, uh, of the sensor, then if, if it's one dimension, it's, it'll do that. If it's two dimensions, it'll do that. If it's three dimensions, it'll do that. And presumably if it's five dimensions, it'll figure that out too. I did ask recently in a recent meeting, could, is that possible? Yeah, super, I thought it was. So, <laughs> but that's the basic idea. If you follow that, if you could visualize what I just said. So all these things tie in is what you said, Vivian, it's like motor and space are sort of one and the same. It's, yeah, so, so it would basically say like however n many dimensions you can learn is not like uh, n dimensions that you perceive, but n dimensions that you can act in. Uh, yes, how I would say. Yeah. yeah. So and it's defined how many mini columns I have available. If I have a hundred mini columns, I'll divide it up into a hundred basic vectors. If I have two hundred, I'll divide it up into two hundred. It's like the spatial pool. It could work in either one of those situations. Um, one you'll have a little bit better resolution. Uh, and the other one, the course of resolution, um, but they'd all still work uh, in the same way. I think that's a, if you follow, that's a very elegant idea. I, again, it's like, oh yeah, all of a sudden we can tie in behavior with representation of space, you know, and then generating movement because we have to figure out how to do that. And, you know, now I can, and, it, and so now it brings, and it brings back in the mini column, you know, hypothesis from Mount Castle and, and, and ties it together in a nice way. So I, I think we're really close to figuring this all out. There's a lot of, I know, difficult concepts that are floating around here, but they're, they're actually, we're really close to putting it all together. It feels that way. Uh, not that we've done it, but it just feels like, oh gosh, we're so close now. <laughs> want to work on it. Anything else you want to talk about? Ask questions, observations? All right, again, before we leave, I want to emphasize, this is not stuff that we have to do in our machine learning work, right? We could, we may end up doing a very simplified version of this. We may do it very differently. <clears throat> this is more just to get education about what's the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve when we're modeling things in movement. And, um, and um, you know, it, 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 the details exactly how it's done, and we're not gonna necessarily do that in our AI. I don't want people to get scared about the neuroscience. For those of you who are not familiar with it, I mean, we'll eventually need to have a lot of the same properties. Um, yeah, the same properties. You know. you know, it's an interesting question. Take take the 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 the, the sort of rectilinear metric space versus the polar coordinate rec, rec, you know vector space. Um, well, it's now clear to me, pretty clear that the polar coordinate system is the way the brain works on, right? So. Um, do we have to do it that way? I don't know. I mean, people build a lot of robotic systems the other way. There's some real nice properties of the polar coordinate system that we we're just talking about, like you know the way you could represent space and learn it and and so on. But and so there's an attractive of doing it that way because we know it works. The brain does it that way. Um, probably, I'm guessing we would probably do it that way, but I don't know. Or maybe the way we would do like the um, instead of using grid cell type reference frames. We might just use a standard Cartesian coordinate reference frame for doing path integration. And maybe, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, it's like, why do we have to do it the way the brain did it in that case? We might still need the same functions, but I don't I don't have the answer to those questions. I'm just saying it's it's uh, we're not gonna end up building cells with you know cell membranes and oscillatory properties and all that kind of stuff. So we have to decide. But I, th I think it would be important to have something where the zero point doesn't matter much. Um, that's interesting. It's really hard. Yeah. It's nice, but why do you think that? I mean, I I, I like that, but it's like I don't know, it's just 
tricky to figure out. <laughs> You're just trying to figure out where is the zero point. And, oh, uh, and that's, a, that's an ill-posed question in some sense. Oh, as and like a system, a system that's- You can do everything you want without having a zero I point. guess you're saying if I engineered a solution, the zero point is easy. But if I don't engineer a solution, if I have to learn the solution, like I'm starting off not knowing the dimensionality of my space, then the zero point might be very difficult to implement. So Maybe, or it can be just something, you just place it completely arbitrarily, but you don't really care where it is. But it has it to, it has to be consistent. Object or anything like that. It has, to be, it has to be consistent. It has to be consistent, but all the operations shouldn't depend on where the zero point yeah. is. Yeah. Well, in Marcus's graph model, um, which I was didn't have finished my slides on, um, you know, there is no zero point. It's everything is relative to everything else. Um, there's a. I was talking to Marcus yesterday about a property that it solves another problem we've had, and this is a really esoteric problem. So I'm sorry for those who don't know this problem, but with grid cells, we had a problem. Imagine a rat has two rooms that it lives in and it goes back and forth between these two rooms and it builds a map of one room and it builds a map of the other room. And when the, and when the rat goes from one room to the other room, the grid cell modules reorient, they re-anchor. So it says, oh, I'm in a new space, new object, I re-anchor. So this is known to occur. Um, now, if you open up the space between the two rooms, so it now starts to look like one room to the rat, if the rat will form a representation of the combined space. But in the grid cell world, it's hard to imagine how that would happen because if the models are based on grid cells, all the knowledge about room A and room B are on two different grid cell mappings. And now if I try to combine the two grid cell mappings, I would lose all my knowledge about at least one of the rooms because you, know, you can't remap and keep all your knowledge. It just doesn't work. So, so that was a problem. But in the new situation where you have a set of objects relative to a set of objects, all with these displacement between the objects, then you can take two maps, room A map and room B map. There's an, and all you have to do is start connecting the edges of them together with the displacements. And all the other displacements come along. It's like, it's, I don't have to worry about remapping them. It's just like, oh, I have this a graph here and a graph here. And as long as I can connect the edges together, then now I have one new graph and it's really simple. I don't have to forget everything I learned about this one. I don't have to get a question. That comes out of Marcus's hypothesis about models being built on um, displacements between components, uh, where the way we had it in the, ref in the frameworks paper and the columns and the columns plus paper, we couldn't do that. Um, you, you, you couldn't combine two previously learned objects like two rooms together into one. It was very, very difficult. Um, so now we have an answer to that question. So that would imply, again, the, the model should be based on um, polar coordinate um, displacements in some sense, because there is no, there's no zero point. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm answering your question too, but I, we're not gonna have a zero point because <laughs> um, a zero point means I have to reconcile two zero points. And I have a zero point for room A, zero point for room two, how can they be, I can't make them the same. But if I don't have any zero points, I just have relationships like tying them together like that. And it works. Yeah. Well, we're just brainstorming now, which is okay <laughs> if you're interested. Um, maybe it's a good time to stop. I'm going to try to have some slides uh, for next week, perhaps, uh, where I can walk through my visualization of the stuff Marcus has written about. Um, and then, Marcus, I hope you don't mind me doing that because. I, it helps me to create those. And I think about it slightly different than you do, but I'm taking your ideas and just trying to put them in a visual framework that helps me think about them. And it might be helpful for other people too. So, um, and I'm extending it a little bit. Um, so hopefully next week I'll have those slides done. <laughs>